But I also think it's flushed out some of the new. Okay, three, two, one. I'm going to start admitting people. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll get started in just a minute or two while we wait for a couple more people to get situated and join. Thank you again for taking the time this morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time this morning. We will get started in just a minute. Um, you don't have to share your webcam. If you want to, you can. Also, feel free to use the, the Zoom chat feature. Just if you have questions, we'll, we'll be sure to answer those towards the end of the event. Or um, if it's an easy answer, maybe one of our, our team members will just answer it directly in the chat. Thank you guys for taking the time. Okay, we have quite a few people already here. So um, I'm Ellie with Choice Solutions, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce Brian Steinlogge from Choice Solutions to get us started. Hey, thank you, Ellie, and uh, welcome to all the uh, customers. And also, too, if we haven't had the the pleasure or privilege of working with your organization, as a we welcome just the conversation, the introduction. You'll have to forgive us. Some of us we don't have the uh, the fancy coffee mugs, so we got to use the little temperature gauge on the top here to keep our coffee warm. But uh, hopefully, you guys are enjoying. We got a little coffee envy right now. Um, but we, once again, we we value your time. We thank you for your time, and we're excited for this discussion. For those of you who may not be uh, familiar with Choice Solutions, just going to hit a couple quick slides here real quick. The, uh, here's our team. Uh, basically, Choice Solutions, we cover, we're located in about nine different states, but this is uh, team members from all across the country. <laughs> this is going back to right before the COVID craziness back in February of uh, 2020. And so uh, this is also to right after the Chiefs Super Bowl. So we're all happy. This, this same group last year would have been all sad as far as we would have had our, our, our red shirts on and uh, cheering that on. But uh, we actually even do have, um, I, I think one of our team members from the across the pond in the UK might be in the picture here as well. And so we we really do look at it as a family. We're a tight knit group. We love what we do. We love the uh, the opportunities that we get a chance to serve great customers like some of you. Um, here's just a little bit about where we serve. In the last five years, uh, we've had the pleasure of serving 750 customers across 43 different states. And so um, we obviously are not pursuing uh, state, you know, business all across, but due to some of the expertise that you'll get a chance to hear um, from one of our architects, we get brought into opportunities. If it has to do with a high-end um, Citrix, Nutanix, some kind of a hybrid cloud solution set that they're bringing us in for our expertise and help them navigate through a new solution that they're evaluating. Um, but like I said, it's been a, uh, I, like I said, this is over the last five years. So just a tremendous honor. You know, what is Choice doing and why are we in business? Really, if you look at what the users are looking for, and this isn't just COVID, this is pre-COVID, this is the remote office, work office, but users, they want to be able to work from anywhere. They want to have a productive system that's um, seamless, that's powerful, especially as we look at the, you know, four generations in the workforce, that younger workforce wants to be able to work from whether it's the coffee shop, their home office, or even to why they're traveling. And so the user desires that consistent experience. Well, what is the business looking for? The business is looking for, they want to attack, uh, attract and retain key talent. Um, they want to have their team members engaged wherever they are, whether that's them logging in after a, a kid's soccer game or that's them in the office being productive. But most importantly, they want to make sure it's secure and that they have control over those systems. Cloud transformation. Every customer is at some gamut uh, across the gamut with this. You know, for us as a company, um, our first foray into the cloud was, you know, uh, Office 365 in the public cloud. And then next was like our unified communication platform with a Gartner leading solution called Ring Central. But every customer is somewhere across this as they're trying to figure out how do they leverage either the private cloud, utilizing virtualization technologies in their data center or into a colo, or also to how do they leverage potentially looking at public platforms like um, Google, Amazon, on or Azure. And so we help the customers kind of reduce that footprint from the costly complex part and try to get into more of a seamless uh, user base and a scalable infrastructure. And so customers are all across the gamut and we engage with them where they're at and try to understand where they're trying to go. You know, 
what are, what are the challenges that, you know, this is nothing new to any of you guys, you know, just struggling to keep up with day-to-day -day tasks, the, uh, the inability to execute on the projects, the focus on the future technology, uh, limitation on the in-house expertise, maybe it's just not being able to keep up with, but also to the challenges of talent development and retention. And so you lose that key per person who has that skill set to help you get to the le next platform or the next generation. And then it's a matter of uh, figuring out how do you contend with that? And what we do is we come alongside. So customers are looking for partners with a, a proven track record. They have the knowledge and expertise um, that bring in innovative solutions, but also to, and this is, it sounds a little bit contrite, but they actually sincerely care. They're genuine people. Um, we've had the, some of our architects and engineers that have been in this over 20 years. And so we love what we do. We love being able to br bring leading edge technology solutions and helping customers, not just, uh, we figured two plus two can no longer equal four in our business, business environment. We've got to figure out how to help a customer do a quantum leap in technology. They've got to get advanced, get ahead of the curve so that they can actually help leverage technology in their business. You know, the tenets of the, any kind of architecture we bring forward, whether that's on-prem or whether it's in the cloud, it's gotta be simple, secure, and automated. Um, those we believe that it's gotta be, you know, simple cloud architectures, secure digital workspaces, and automated um, IT services. And so we try to figure out how do we help you adapt as you're evaluating some of those solutions. What do we do? So. Um, some customers, we work with them just on like hardware and software uh, uh, solution evaluation. We bring our team of resources and help them evaluate platforms they're looking at um, as they're looking to what's the best solution for them, that next generation type technology. Um, with our professional services team, we are, have the ability to architect, um, assess, design, help them install and deploy those solutions. And also too, for some customers, they're really struggling in the middle there is back to the, the challenges they're dealing with is that they might not have the IT talent. They might not have the ability to maintain and to manage that infrastructure. And that's what we come along with what we call our managed services. This could be a managed service or it could even be a co-managed service where we bring our team tools and technologies and we help partner with you and figure out where are your gaps as an organization and where can we bring our solution set and our team and to help fill that gap to put you guys focus on what's actually moving your business forward and we'll help maintain, keep the lights on and help de deliver a stable platform for users that can access anywhere at any time. Before I get ready to introduce over to uh, some of our speakers today, let me stop the share here and uh, get to introduce uh, both uh, Shane Kleinert, who's one of our senior architects um, out of the Southeast, but also to Joel Stalker and Trenton Tai. Um, when we start talking about Control Up, you know, Choice Solutions has the honor of being a platinum partner with Control Up, but literally it is, uh, it is literally peanut butter and jelly for us, meaning that Control Up is not something, it's something we integrate and in not only in everything we do from a professional service standpoint, but also too with our managed service office. Offering. It is a phenomenal solution. A lot of the customers, maybe some of you have come to it in that, that Citrix, that EUC space. Today, we're super excited to learn more of where ControlUp has taken their platform and ad additional functionality that's going to be available to all of us as they continue forward. So Shane, Joel, Trenton, thank you guys for taking the time today. We're looking forward to the presentation. Awesome. Yeah, th Brian, thank you for the uh, awesome introduction to, to Joyce and excited to be here today. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Um, so yeah, as, as Brian mentioned, you no know, ups is kind of integrated into everything you do into, into our DNA and, and uh, kind of got a cool history with control up. You know, I was kind of on the early advisory board for them when they just kind of came over from Israel back, I think it was like 2014 at the first synergy. So I kind of got to know them from the early days and it's just really cool to, to see control up expand so much from, you know, the early days of, you know, uh, five people, right. And to where they're at today, kind of globally, uh, and just some incredible innovations in the platform. So it's exciting to be here uh, with the team uh, and and uh, and kind of talk through, um, you know, kind of where, where control ups at now and kind of some of the new features and why these features were developed around kind of the remote DX technology. And really it's why it's a necessity uh, kind of for the remote computing today, because, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's kind of blend of, as Brian had mentioned, kind of work and home, you know, our personal and, and, and business life, right? And, and the end of the day, I mean, Netflix is killing it, uh, Apple TV, right? And, and your kids are at home and they're watching this cool stuff and you're trying to do business work. And at the end of the day, you know, it comes back. It's like Citrix sucks. It's all, it's not, how do we know it's Citrix, right? How do we know it's not the home Wi-Fi? So the team's going to kind of dive into that. So, yeah. So with that, uh, we have uh, uh, Joel uh, on here. For, he's kind of head of, head of product marketing for Control Up. So excited to have him on and also uh, uh, Trenton, uh, senior technical expert at uh, Control Up. 
uh, all around cool dude as well. So super technical, kind of see him out in the community doing these uh, technical deep dives. So awesome to see him here at, at Control Up doing those uh, for Control Up as well, using the technology. So yeah, I mean, with that, uh, you know, hopefully everyone has a cup of coffee. Got my Starbucks uh, pumpkin spice here. First time in a long time. Not as good as it used to be, by the way. Um, but yeah, with that said, let's uh, let's pass it off to, to Joel and Trent and let's kind of get going. We want this to be interactive. So, you know, we're on Zoom here. Pop on the camera if you want, uh, or at minimum, you know, throw some some questions out. You know, we'd like to make it interactive. So, yeah, I'll pass uh, thanks, it off to, to you, Joel. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I thought that we decided that you changed and not the, the pumpkin latte. Yeah, it could. Yeah. It, I think it probably was me to be on my taste buds, man. I got a lot more healthy. I looked at this thing. It's like 390 calories. I took away the whipped cream in two shots. So I'm probably at like 180 uh, right now. So. Uh, well, th thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, for, sure. uh, for those people who are unfamiliar with me, uh, so I joined Control Up uh, last year. Actually, I had an in-person interview in February, but my start date was when everything shut down. So I, uh, I I started just around that time. But before that, I spent almost 19 years in various roles at Citrix. Um, spent a lot of time in the field as a sales engineer over, over the years. Uh, that's also actually... Uh, what I started doing at Control Up before I joined the product marketing team. And, um, you know, it's great to be in this market. Uh, obviously, there are the vendors like Citrix and Microsoft and, uh, uh, and, and, and VMware who provide us with, with great platforms and great flexibility in, uh, you know, kind of like the, the, the base infrastructure and the platforms that your users need to, to work from anywhere. But what, what we've seen is that the experience, and I know that, that Brian talked about the user experience and what we more and more see talking to our customers is that they talk about what, what, what now is referred to as a digital employee experience. And uh, it's, you know, it's partially marketing there. Um, you, know, you see, for example, that a company like Gartner they started talking about DEX now, uh, their latest hype cycle. They, they actually initiated the discipline for DEX. And uh, this is becoming more and more important. Just like you said, Shane, it's, uh, you know, it's always been important. But I guess in the past, as IT folks, they could get away with saying like, well, the problem is not on our side. The problem is on your side. And good luck with that. And I think that what we've seen over this last year is that that becomes less and less of an acceptable answer uh, since everybody is remote now and, and or at least to a certain extent. And uh, so managing that digital employee experience and you know, kind of like going places and getting gaining visibility in you know, places where you previously didn't have them is critical uh, to make this a success. But, but there's much more to it. So what, what I want to do is kind of like lay the land a little bit, because for those people who are familiar with Control Up, uh, you might know us as Citrix monitoring or maybe EUC monitoring. And that's something that, that Control Up has been doing for, uh, for just over a decade. Uh, uh, as Shane mentioned, uh, in 2014, uh, uh, you know, th that's kind of when we came here on this side of, uh, of the ocean and you know, started really penetrating the market here. Uh, but yeah, the, the funny thing is that Control Up actually was born in a Citrix environment. This was a partner, a Citrix partner in, in Israel. Uh, they, you know, this was the day of Edge Site, and they didn't really see a solution for from Citrix themselves to uh, to remediate issues quickly, to find issues and to remediate them quickly. So they started building that themselves and. You know, I believe it was freeware initially. You know, people could just download it. Uh, but eventually, uh, they turned this into a product that people, um, uh, people can, can, can get. And that is kind of where Control Up grew up. And I think that's important to understand because with Citrix and with Horizon, yeah, everything kind of is already about that user experience. Right? There's all these factors like the network that quickly can impact on how the user experiences something. So we really understand this, but there's much more to it. And uh, this last year has learned, uh, you know, has clear, made clear that yeah, although a lot of our customers already were doing Citrix, maybe Horizon, it definitely like, accelerated the adoption. And um, in that we also now see more and more customers that are 
getting more diversity. They're looking at Azure, AVD. They, they're looking at other platforms to kind of quickly scale and grow. And uh, that's good, for, good news for us because the more complexity, the more we can simplify things in how to address issues in such an environment. And uh, I will talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. But you as you know, here on this call, you probably noticed last year when this all started happening, uh, all of a sudden you, you had to go monitor these environments and kind of manage this digital experience in a much more diverse environment. You kind of went from maybe you have like one or two offices uh, to, you know, many more. We have customers that maybe have you know, 20 offices with 20,000 employees and they kind of overnight went to monitoring and, or at least having the requirement to see into those 20,000 offices. So uh, that obviously, you know, brings some challenges. And when we kind of talk to our customers, we see them saying a lot of things, but the main things are, are how am I now going to kind of like cover end to end from my virtual, my VDI, my virtual apps, whatever, whatever deployment method you do to all the way to the endpoint, including the network where the user is working on. Um, Shane, you mentioned Netflix, right? There could be children at home watching Netflix that affects that. And uh, we, we actually use that example as well. Uh, in my case, it's actually my wife who's watching Netflix. Yeah, but, same uh, with me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but it can definitely obviously impact. You know, what, uh, and it, it's not just about the applications or the other things that are happening on the network. It's also the when, because you know, most people stop doing the kind of office hours, uh, especially with other things going on in the house or homeschooling or you know, you, your, your work style changes and also the hours that you work. So that other things on your network might conflict with doing work you know, is actually a part of that problem as well. And uh, that also extends, in my opinion, to uh, what I'm seeing with how IT handles this. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody here wants to work 24 seven. So how are you going to ensure that uh, your network resources and your SaaS applications, as well as your EUC resources are all available all the time, ideally, right? That is where kind of what we want to work to. So uh, that is another challenge that we hear from our customers. And then there's this shift in, I often talk about how customers are very focused on SLAs when it comes to their IT operations. What we start seeing with some of our customers, they start talking about XLAs, uh, experience level uh, agreements, uh, which is a much broader topic in, uh, you know, you're not just looking at the metrics and uptime and is thing, are things working, but also how is the user actually feeling about this application? So these are three areas where we kind of provide solutions for. And it's very simplified. It's about making sure that all systems are green, all systems are available, and all systems are reporting. Now, before I'm going to hand it over to Trenton, let me just uh, very high level talk about these three areas. So when we talk about all systems green, it's really about using uh, real-time monitoring across the virtual EUC side, all the way to the physical endpoint where the user is connected from. Now, we grew up in the EUC world, but we, over this last year, we uh, actually added technology and it's called HDX. And I believe the trend that is going to maybe show a little bit of that as well. But HDX is really about bringing all these great capabilities we already had for Citrix environments and Horizon, et cetera, to the physical endpoint. So now we can monitor and optimize the physical endpoint that the user is working from as well. Maybe they're not even using Citrix. Uh, we can do you know, full management and optimization of the physical endpoint, Windows, Mac, or Linux, or even Agile devices uh, in, uh, in your environment. And it's everything that affects that experience in between. Right? We just talked about that local Wi-Fi and local ISP uh, connectivity. Uh, we now, and, and this is a big part of Trenders Demo, we can now show you actually very in a very simple way and you know, without having to do too many complicated things, what is affecting that digital experience of your user remote? All systems available is something that's also fairly new. So we already had great automation features, which is part of this as well. 
Uh, it's great that we do troubleshooting and remediation. You know, an IT admin can go in and say, okay, this is the issue, boom, I fix it. But it's much better if the IT admin doesn't necessarily have to do that manually. So automation, of course, plays a role in uh, automatically fixing issues or before they're actually affecting the users that are working with them. But proactive synthetic monitoring is a new and important part of this as well. Uh, this is something that until May last year, we didn't do. Uh, we actually built this in-house, it's called ScoutBees. And ScoutBees uh, basically does continuous testing, not only for EUC, so not only for your Citrix apps and desktops and the related infrastructure, but it also extends into testing SaaS applications, uh, uh, web applications, networking resources. It was funny the other day when uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram went down. Uh, I actually found out through a colleague who said, hey, my, one of my tests is, is reporting that there's an issue with Facebook. Uh, and you know, that's a good example. That's of course very consumer focused, but you have your important enterprise web applications and SaaS applications as well. So definitely a part of it, and this is really focused on uh, prevention of issue, making sure that you're getting ahead of the user, even if you can't fix it, because you, know, you and I can't fix Facebook or Azure if it's down, but we can at least inform the user if there's an issue like that, so that they're not opening like 400 help desk tickets saying, hey, it's not working. And that will already help you in you know, becoming a better service provider for uh, these environments. And the final thing is, this is all about the historical data and being able to find this all in one place. A single place where your help desk employees can help their users, where you as uh, uh, you know, kind of like the, the, the IT leadership or IT administrators can, you know, do what you need to do to make the service better, uh, all from one place. But then also using the data you collect through Control Up to make, yeah, you know, not only reports, but also be more predictive for the future. Uh, you can't really say give trending or forecasting information without historical data. So it's an important part of our solution to make sure that you bring in that historical data to make better decisions for the future. Now, this slide is uh, a very busy slide, uh, but it's really to show you that you know, no matter what you run, what kind of apps or what kind of EUC infrastructure or what kind of DAS platform or what kind of uh, 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 endpoints you use, if that's physical or, or virtual or like thin clients or whatever, you can bring that all together in control of in a central place, no more hopping around to different dashboards and tools to find the issue. It's all in one place where you can see it and fix it. And this is uh, not something I'm going to go in a very deep in, but uh, we recently actually worked with Forrester Consulting to do an ROI analysis. So obviously, you know, budgets are always fun. Uh, budgets are always under pressure. So, you know, giving you the, you know, the, the insights in how control up can also do this cost effectively. Um, we have much more details on that in, uh, on our website with the Forrester uh, total economic impact study we recently did with one of our customers. All right, so that's all the talking for me and I'm pretty sure that I already talked too much. So uh, now we're going to see stuff. So let me stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna hand it over to Trenton. Right. Okay. Just checking. Everyone can see my screen. We're good. Yep. Good. good. Here, okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, just a little bit about the control of product and, and what we're here to show today. So we're going to show essentially the real time uh, product. So that's the monitoring and management. And then we're going to show, we're going to highlight a feature of it called remote DX, which we introduced this year that Joel kind of went over that shows you uh, this some performance metrics of your remote endpoints that are connected into your environment. And then we'll show Edge DX as well, which is our um, remote endpoint monitoring and management piece. So what we're looking at here, once you have control up in your environment and you set up some monitors, we have this product called Solve, which is our web-based interface, which is what you're looking at here with the dashboard. Um, just a new feature within Solve, we, we did get some feedback that obviously our pre-built dashboards are not sufficient for everybody. So there's user experience and resources out of the box, but you can also customize and create your own dashboards uh, by clicking on add widgets and you get some interesting stuff here. So it's perfect for knock and help desk type views. Um, but I'm gonna look at our environment here. So I'm gonna switch over to the discovery view. 
And what you see here on the left is our control up EUC tree structure. So down here with the folders, this is a logical structure you create and control up. And you add machines to these folders and however you want to organize it. And then you can apply automations and stuff to the resources within the folders themselves. Folders can be nested and have machines within them and so on and so forth. Up here, we have our dynamic uh, infrastructure. So these, these are all the folder icons that are you know unique and pretty. Um, so what these are is once you add in uh, like hypervisors into your environment, we can we actually just start uh, interrogating them and start populating this tree automatically, and then you can start monitoring it. So I'm going to look at our hypervisor environment here, where all the hypervisors in our environment. And I can see I've got one cluster that's reporting really high average disk IOPS. So I know that this is a problem because it's red. Um, and this stress level here is telling me that uh, we got some critical stressed hosts that are contributing to this. So I want to find out what that is. So I'm going to click on the hosts here at the top of the topology bar. And we can see all of our hosts within the cluster that we're monitoring. And we can see VM host one has a, a critical stress level. And just hovering over top, we get a tooltip callout telling us that the data store is having some kind of health issue. So if I scroll to the right to look at those metrics, of course, they stand out like a sore thumb because they're bright red for everybody. Um, so now that we have this metric, what can we do with it? So we have two different options here on the right. So here is our historical view. So we can get a little glance of how this uh, resource was performing over some period of time. So I can go all the way back to 72 hours. Or if we expand it out, we can go all the way back to one month's worth of time. So very quick to get some historical inf information as to what's going on uh, in the resources in your environment. But we want to troubleshoot this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click this little arrow here. And what Control is going to do is it's going to drill into that resource and then sort the UI based on relevant metrics for the column you clicked. So since we clicked on a disk related metric, we've got this blue bar here at the top showing us all disk related metrics first. So this is helping us troubleshoot. So this is telling us, hey, you, you wanted to explore something that we thought was disk related. So here's all the disk related metrics related to that problem. And sure enough, we can see we've got lots of red going across it. We can see the virtual machine that's causing or, or that's having this problem inflicted on it. Um, so at this point, you know, we could uh, log on to vCenter or something like that and reboot the virtual machine, but we still haven't quite root caused it. So I'm going to continue drilling down here, and I'm going to do that by clicking on these little arrows here, and it's telling you where it's going to go next. So it's going to go into the virtual machine, into the sessions view on that machine. And once it does that, we'll see that we have a, a couple sessions on here, and we can see very, very quickly that one particular user is causing our problem. So again, we're, we're sorted according to disk metrics on the virtual machine itself. We got one user here who's just bright red telling us that he's got some kind of problem. So now I can reach out to that user or I could even, you know, log on to the server and just log him off or whatever I want to do to solve that. But I still haven't quite root caused it. I know who's causing it, but I don't know what's causing it. So again, if I click on the arrow to drill into this user session now, we see all the processes within that session. And sure enough, now I've got a process in here, Dynamo.exe. I can see it's the one consuming all the IO read operations. And if I scroll to the right, we can see it's doing also the write operations as well. So this is what's consuming all of our uh, disk performance. And if I continue to scroll to the right, I can see, you know, interesting stuff. I can see the description is IO meter, it's by Intel. So now I can start Googling that, you know, what is this process and so on and so forth. So for those who don't know, IO meter is a disk performance tool um, that you use to test your underlying infrastructure to see how performant it is. So potentially this is a user who started this, maybe they forgot it or so on and so forth. Um, so we need to rectify this. So in order to solve this problem, I'm going to switch now into the control up uh, real-time console. So this is the C-sharp product that we have within Control Up. And I'm just going to follow the same flow here, but I'll show you that within the Control Up C-sharp console, we can do actions. So I'm going to focus on hosts, and we can see our one host here who is in critical state. If I click the little button, it tells me what, what's contributing to that. Uh, so I'm going to click on this little guy here, since I know he's in red, and here we can navigate down into the machines view. And then here we can actually take an action. So I can right-click on this uh, resource and take some kind of um, remediation action. So since this is a virtual machine, we get a virtual, uh, a contextual menu that's sensitive to this virtual machine. So these are all virtual machine actions. So from here, you know, I can reboot the machine, I can forcibly shut it off if I wanted to, <clears throat> or things like that. I could send messages to all the users on it, or 
Um, this is a very powerful feature we have where we can actually take uh, a PowerShell script or a batch script or a VB script, and we can actually take all of our columns and pass those as parameters into the script, giving it contextual awareness to what it's looking at. So with script actions, we can ex extend control up to do almost anything. There's hundreds and hundreds of script actions that have been written for the various use cases that uh, our customers have encountered and even the communities encountered out there. So obviously I don't wanna uh, reboot this machine to solve this problem. So I'm gonna drill into the sessions view and let's take a quick look at the sessions uh, contextual menu for what actions we can do here. So here we can initiate a chat with the user. We can start asking them like, you know, hey, what's going on? I noticed um, that you're consuming a lot of IO. What, what's that about? Uh, or I can do things like I can get a session screenshot. So you can see our three different options here. Um, why this is important is we can actually, through our security policy down here, enable and disable every single option you see here. So for this get session screenshot, if you work in a healthcare environment, or a financial environment or somewhere like that where security is and privacy is of the utmost value, um, we can actually disable these menu options so that way no one can execute that. Or you can tier it. So this could be with user approval, could be for help desk, with user notification could be for tier two and without notifying these could be for you know your super admins, your tier four type guys. Um, so since I still don't know what's going on in this session, we can just imagine that even though we do, I am going to continue my drill down. And now we're back into the processes view. And again, you can see control up is sorting the columns here. The real time console and solve are a bit different, solves um, our new product. So it's getting a lot more um, abilities when it comes to the columns and being able to sort and stuff like that. But here we can see control up, the real time console does its best to try to identify the column of interest, tells us what we're troubleshooting and then identify the column underneath that it thinks uh, will help guide your troubleshooting. So here we're on that dynamo.exe. So for this particular use case, I don't know that this, if this was like a report generator or something like that, um, we don't want to terminate this because obviously we want that work to complete. So again, taking remediation action, I can, on the process level, I can end the process, kill the process. I can change affinity. Maybe I only want it to run on one core if these are like eight core machines. So that way the other seven can service other users. Um, I can adjust the process party, maybe bringing it to below normal or idle. So that way it's not consuming CPU from uh, other users who might be on this box. But I'm actually going to start CPU throttling here. So I'm going to throttle it to 4% and I'm just going to hit OK here. And what's beautiful about control up is it's real time nature. So because uh, control up is real time, there's cause and effect. We literally just took uh, a, a remediation action on this process and we can see the effect of that change. We're not waiting 10 minutes. We're not waiting 15 minutes to see, you know, did, did it happen or did something else happen to occur during that time? I dropped that CPU percentage to four or 5% and we can see the effects uh, within seconds. And of course I can actually do the reverse. I can stop CPU throttling on this process. And then boom, we'll see everything just throttle right back up to its resource consuming ways. So with control up, you get that cause and effect, which helps you understand tremendously in your environment what things do and what things are. Uh, so I saw in the poll that Shane had put in the chat that uh, what EUC environments you guys are running. And a lot of people put Citrix and Horizon. So I've got some great news for you there. Um, we support both Horizon and Citrix and Citrix Cloud within Control Up for our native integrations. Uh, of course, we support the native Windows operating system out of the box. So anything that runs Windows, we can monitor and manage. But when it comes to Citrix and Horizon, we do provide additional information um, within the EUC environments feature here. Uh, so I'm going to switch to folders there and we can see all the different information that you can pull out of there. So just for a quick, quick view, I'm just going to drill into our delivery groups here. And you can see all the different metrics that you get within uh, control up here. And then with our automation, we can take any one of these columns and any one of the data in between, and we can say, uh, does the resource have this value? So for instance, we can see is CVAD physical. So we could do an automation that says, if CVAD physical is yes, then do some kind of action, right? Run an optimization tool, run disk cleanup or something like that. Um, so we can do that. We can tie multiple columns together. So we can say, you know, is the CVAD physical if it's not? And if it's a shared desktop and if the uptime is more than, say, two days, then reboot it. And we can say only as long as CVAD user sessions are zero. 
So we can do really complex things like that. And that's for both Horizon and Citrix. So really, really cool stuff you can do within control up in our automation and the columns and the capabilities there. So we wanted to get into Remote DX. So this is our one of our new features that we're offering. So I'll show it within here, then I'll show you what we see within Solve as well. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm focusing on my v, VDI and SPC environment. So this is both Citrix and Horizon. Uh, these are all the sessions connected. So we can see I've got these Windows 8 sessions here, Windows 7, Mac OS. So obviously uh, for our Remote DX feature, uh, just a quick primer as to what that is. It's a virtual channel driver that gets installed alongside your Citrix workspace app or your um, Horizon client. And what it does is when you connect into your environment, Control Up opens a channel to the uh, client and it starts interrogating for some information. And so this is the information we're interrogating for. So we're interrogating for Wi-Fi signal strength. You can see we've got a bunch here in the 70%, some in the 90s. We're doing a LAN latency test. So that means we're taking your endpoint and we're pinging the local gateway. Uh, so that's usually that you know default gateway that you see when you get IP config. Um, and I'll explain why that's important uh, in a bit. And then we also get the total session latency, which is essentially the same thing that uh, Citrix and Horizon both have, where um, it measures the latency of the packets from your session to um, your endpoint. And then we have the total, uh, the internet latency, sorry, which is where it pings 8.8.8.8. Uh, just to see if you know, do you have a bad route right out of out of your ISP or anything like that? Um, and for the most part, we can see you know our routes are pretty good, but we do have some devices here that look like they're having some some kind of issue. Uh, so if I continue to scroll to the right, we can see some additional metadata information. So we got the client nickname, what what kind of network card it is, the client nick speed, um, the client network type, the public IP. So uh, you're able to actually geolocate users uh, through some of our script actions that we have here by running it against the client IP. Um, the local router IP, so this is where the gateway is being pinged, the Wi-Fi SSID and the BSSID. And why these two values are important is that a lot of networks have mesh networks. And um, a mesh network has the same SSID, but very different BSSIDs, because the BSSID is the physical hardware address of the antenna that your uh, device is connected to. So if you have a mesh network or something like that, you could have different BSSIDs, even though the SSIDs are the same. And so if you're encountering some kind of health issue, uh, you're actually able to identify that exact device by using the BSSID. So if you see one device is good and one device is not, um, very clearly it it points it just jumps out at you uh, very very quickly. And with Control Up, you know we could drag it up here and just do grouping, so we can immediately see all the different devices that happen to be connected to a particular BSSID. Very cool stuff. Uh, so continuing to scroll to the right here, we can see uh, the Wi-Fi authentication. So this is whether you know whether it's using secured uh, connection or whether it's like an open access point like you might find in a coffee shop, which is obviously horrific for security because anyone could be man in the middle and snooping on your Wi-Fi traffic in, in an open scenario. So we do have some script actions that can detect that this column has the word open in it and automatically uh, send a notice to a user telling them, hey, you're in an open access point, you might want to log off. But if you wanted to, you could also attach our very well used log off script action to that trigger to that automation, forcibly log off the user after some time. Uh, so obviously we get the Wi-Fi radio type, channel, the, how long your uh, user is inactive on their actual endpoint. So this isn't the session, this is the endpoint. And where this becomes important is uh, when you want to track productivity, because obviously people who um, have a session open, they might be watching like a training video or something locally, because you don't want to be streaming that across your session. Uh, so this will help identify that because if you see a client inactive time of zero or blank, which means that they're currently doing something, uh, but you see a session inactive time being quite high, you can reasonably assume that they're actually doing work on their uh, endpoint itself. Obviously, we're pulling the client OS name so you can actually sort by um, operating system type for whatever they're connected in and client OS version and so on and so forth. So that's remote DX in a nutshell, but let's switch over to solve and see what we get with these metrics in solve. So I've switched back to solve and I'm just going to uh, stop my troubleshooting investigation here and go back to um, the main window. Perfect. So now I'm going to click on user sessions here and this is going to show all my user sessions. And now we can see I'm sorting by client device score here and it's telling me I've got four sessions that are having some kind of health issue. And so if I click on the little house icon next to it, 
this gives me a beautiful representation of what uh, the user is experiencing in their environment. So here we can see the land latency for this particular device is about 30 milliseconds, which is pretty bad. Um, land latency should be like 10 milliseconds or less at worst when it's on a wireless connection or um, like zero to one milliseconds if you have a wired connection. So 31 is pretty bad. And if we wanted to think about why that might be, um, the challenge with home wireless networks is these wireless consumer access points generally have like a 50 um, connection limit. And so every device that connects into a router, uh, unless it's a Wi-Fi AX router, which is a Wi-Fi 6 router, which is brand new, um, it every device that connects into a Wi-Fi router takes some amount of time to do its processing. And it's all happens in order in turn. So that means once you send your packets, you have to wait uh, for the router to process it. And then it goes through every other device and then it sends your response. And then once it receives something from you, it goes through and so on and so forth. And with Internet of Things and home Wi-Fi and... Um, you know, smart homes and stuff like that, the more devices you connect, the higher this land latency will eventually start to get. So for this particular case, we can see, you know, 22 milliseconds, maybe not the best. It, it's not really affecting my sessions too much. So that looks pretty good. Um, but let's look at someone else. There might be someone else who's having a more severe problem. Like this guy, 325 milliseconds, that's his land latency. And once you have this value like this, this is the floor that the rest of this network connection kind of operates at. So none of these values should be less than 232 milliseconds. They should both be higher because obviously this is your first hop, 210 milliseconds. So now we can very quickly identify, we saw T home B was good, T home two looks pretty poor. Uh, so this router could be overloaded, could have all those IOT devices, maybe, um, you know, lots of routers have really rich functionality. Maybe I'm running BitTorrent on it. Maybe there's a backup going on. Maybe it's a Plex media server. You know, these home routers can do all of these functions and all of that takes CPU time away from processing packets, which can affect your local performance. And then obviously streaming things like Netflix and whatnot. Um, maybe they put a QoS rule or something like that to optimize traffic because, you know, as, as everyone was saying, there's family members who um, maybe complain when, uh, there's poor performance there. So that's the kind of visualization we get within Solve. And Solve also has these beautiful colors and graphs and stuff within it as well uh, to really visualize what you're seeing there. So super cool, super awesome. That's what uh, Control Up and Solve and the Remote DX feature can offer all of your remote users. And again, because it's a virtual channel driver, it's only ever active with the session. Um, so there's not really any concern there that you might um, might be asking your home users if these are home machines. Uh, to actually install this software because it's no different really than the workspace app um, and software like that. And I mean, you, you might be asking people to install like the Teams optimization too. So we do have documentation on bun on creating a bundle. So a single executable that self extracts and installs both the workspace app or the Horizon client with Remote DX. So you can look at our website for that kind of information. Uh, so now I'm going to get hey, into Brenton? Edge. Yeah. Um, I, I... I, I see like a whole bunch of questions. I saw something about VPN. So m maybe before you move away from remote DX, uh, we can take some of those uh, right now. Sure. And Shane, I think yeah, you- Yeah, you, you, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I answered a lot of them. The The VPN one was when I asked actually from a customer uh, a customer that had the, a question for their, uh, for their environment. They're looking at a remote DX demo. They were asking kind of when you pulled up that diagram showing kind of the, the, the endpoint latency Right. So right here, you know, the you're seeing kind of the natted IP, right? They were curious to, to know, are you going to see their the public IP? Say they were on an always on VPN, for instance, you know, would you see the public IP of, from, from the business perspective, you know, where that data center kind of where you're terminating in? Or are you going to see the public IP from your ISP standpoint? Um, so it'd be cool. I think control up obviously can see both, but I don't know that it's displayed here. But it was a, it was a good question that they had for always on VPN. I don't know if you, you guys uh, can see that information today or it's, it's in this all. Yeah, I can answer that. So we actually had this exact scenario come up because obviously VPNs from home is is a thing that people do. Yep. Um, and so we have had customers uh, install this and we have tested it ourselves. And the answer is yes, we do see the VPN connection and the data you see is the VPN stats. So the metrics you're seeing here are from your primary uh, network adapter. So if you have both Wi-Fi and you're wired in uh, and your Ethernet is your primary adapter, this will be Ethernet based stats, not Wi-Fi based stats. So when you have a VPN and you enable it, it becomes the primary adapter. So all of these metrics will show VPN related information. So your, your first hop, your gateway will probably be your VPN gateway. Um, and then these metrics will be re reflective of what that 
uh, performances on your VPN connection. Okay. No, that's uh, that's that's good information. So yeah, I think that answers. I don't know if they're on the call, but uh, yeah, I think that'll that'll definitely help them out. There are a couple other questions I think we answered, but just a quick recap. Uh, there was you know a question around kind of monitoring outside of the EC environment. Um, you know, obviously you guys can do that today. That's kind of a great great kind of add-in that Control Up has always done, just being holistic, right? So even if they're non EUC environment, obviously EUC is just the delivery fabric, right? There's other backend applications, multi-tiered apps, that sort of stuff that you want to monitor and that can- Yeah, so, so Shane, I think I think in your answer, you were kind of referring to, hey, you can uh, run control of agent on different types of VMs, different yep. types of workloads. Server, and I think that Trent's brain immediately went to this one, which is kind of the other side, right? So where are you connecting from? Uh, what physical endpoint device? Yep. Right. Yeah, and that's and that's a good point too. Yeah, because I was referring more to the back end, but obviously now you guys from that acquisition, you guys can do the front end too. So yeah, I'm gonna cover that. That's definitely neat to show as well. Yeah, right. So th this is a good segue to this. So um obviously one of the challenges we had is that with the remote DX feature, it only works when you have an EUC session established. Uh but if you have, you know, SaaS applications and stuff like that where you don't need a EUC connection. How do you monitor those devices, those laptops that everyone has sent out to all of their employees um, that maybe they don't need a VPN because you're using Gmail or something like that, or you've got Outlook online and and so on and so forth. So you don't require like a network connection into your uh, data center anymore. It's all being hosted in the cloud. So what we can do is we have this new product called EdgeDX, and it's an agent that you install on your uh, devices that you send out to your customers or your, your users. And from there, we can actually monitor and manage the device uh, as long as it has an internet connection. Um, so it'll actually monitor the device even when there's no internet connection. It'll it'll queue up all the performance data over that period of time. And then once the internet connection is established, it re-uploads it to Edge. And then we can see how the device is performing over some, some period of time. But this allows us to monitor those remote devices all the time. So this is your 24 by 7 remote monitoring of your remote devices that you've provided to your users for those particular use cases. So this is uh, Edge DX, this is the main splash screen when you land on it. So you can see our device platforms here. Um, we've got quite a bit of Windows, quite a bit of Linux and a little bit of Mac OS. Um, the Wi-Fi samples of all the Wi-Fi devices over the period of time, uh, over the last hour of all these devices of 44 uh, managed devices that we have in our environment. Uh, so obviously you can see the devices connected to Edge DX and not. You, we've got this beautiful map here actually doing geolocation lookup uh, of the devices and telling us where they're located. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the manage devices here and we're going to look at all the devices within our demo environment here. So here you can see these are all the devices that have been connected to our Edge DX. We've got some devices that are online, some devices that are offline. So I'm just going to sort by devices that are online. All right, so we can see anything that's green here means that they're online. We got some devices that are connected in through Ethernet and some that are connected in through Wi-Fi. And that's obviously a telltale sign of the signal strength. Uh, for my two Mac OS devices here, we could see I've got you know network latency issues. I can immediately see I've got memory issues. These devices, they have <laughs> really insufficient RAM for what they're trying to do. Uh, and that's okay, that's on purpose uh, for my particular demo here, but this would be obviously something that you would be really concerned about. Um, and what I'm gonna do is if I click on, I'm actually gonna find my other device. Uh, let's go back to the search and I'm gonna search for RDX. This shows me my Windows 7 machine and how he's performing and click on him. And now we drill into the device view where we actually see performance related metrics of that device over you know, the last day or however long you want your date range to be. Um, obviously, I've got my my carts, my charts being uh, stacked side by side, but we can choose to go over top so you can get that uh, temporal view of what was happening on that device over some period of time. So pretty good, pretty cool. If we hover over top, we get tool tips as to what was contributing to that. Very neat for the, the charts and graphs that are within here. Obviously, you can see up top, we've got some interesting things. We've got actions where we can actually uh, run a script against these machines. Um, so we do have uh, scripts that we're, we're writing at the moment, and we're going to come out with stuff. We've got you know standard ping test, trace test to your uh, local gateway, um, some out-of-the-box stuff. We can get the Windows CPU speed, maybe some event log entries if you want to do some remote troubleshooting. Uh, and so on and so forth. But if you want to actually do local troubleshooting, we have this assist feature. And so this is new as of a couple of weeks ago. 
Uh, so you can send a message to the user. We can create a remote PowerShell prompt on this particular device. So let me hit a start remote shell here. And boom, we've got the command. So now we're, we can run just PowerShell on that device. Very cool. Um, and then what's really good is now we can do remote control and remote shadow. So obviously these are two options that can be controlled. Uh, so that way you can do role-based access for these particular features. So I'm going to hit remote control on this one and the user is going to say, okay. And we'll look at what the remote control offers. There we go. Uh, so here we're looking at this particular device now. So it looks like they were watching a video. Um, down here is our little control telling you what's going on. Uh, but here you can see I can control the mouse. So any anywhere in the world, if someone is having some problems, as long as they're connected to the internet, with HDX, we're actually able to remotely monitor the device. So I think this is super cool. Um, and then obviously we can do some power management features as well. Uh, Trent, HDX, so, oh, just a quick question for you. Uh, uh, the vision on kind of the Edge DX product, I had a customer ask this. I think it's a good question maybe for the, for the audience, right? Because so, some folks might have, you know, Microsoft endpoint management or Citrix endpoint management or AirWatch, right? And they, they say, well, I already have these solutions, you know, to manage the endpoints. But you see the vision here is more about kind of extending that, that you know, experience, right? So really understanding what that, performance metrics are and, and what that experience is versus being kind of a remote management utility and kind of giving you that insight. What, like, I guess, where do you see the blend there? Do you see remote DX being something that's eventually going to do more endpoint management or keeping it more on kind of that, what traditionally, what, you know, how control up has, has been in the current environments today with monitoring and some slight actions and things like that? Yeah, I, I, well, I can share what I, I believe the, the thought process is, and Joel could probably share his opinion as well. But for remote DX, I feel like the selling feature there is we want to be able to monitor uh, essentially any device. That includes home machines. And home machines are obviously a really tricky scenario because if you install you know full feature endpoint management software like Edge DX or something like that, um, there's a lot of privacy concerns and there's a lot of a lot of uncomfortableness about monitoring, you know, personal machines. Um, whereas for edge for remote DX, it's very, very well suited for that because it's read only. It's only ever active uh, when your session is active. So like the privacy limit, the privacy concerns are really, really limited in scope. And then obviously the features that we're offering there are read only. Um, so that helps just kind of alleviate that, that level of, uh, of concern. Whereas Edge DX is much more full featured and gives you that management capability as well. So for Edge DX, we are really positioning that for the corporate laptop that you're delivering to those users and remote DX, we're saying is very friendly for home machines as well. Yeah, let me let me just add a little bit of color to that. So I think that our focus as far as the features you will see coming for Edge DX and of course for our whole platform will be more focused around what is affecting the experience of the yeah. user. Now That's we awesome. have an agent, so you can see installed applications, missing patches, and you know these are kind of like more system inventory kind of things. Are we going to focus on those? Um, you know, we we this was uh, we acquired Avasi, which you know they had these capabilities in it, so we moved them over. But I think what you see more as far as uh, uh, you know in the future is things like you know, how's the digital experience of the user how you know we're, we're looking at to adding features about you know how is zoom performing how is uh, um, uh, teams performing right so a really specific application kind of digital experience monitoring and management right also being able to react to that are we going down the path of enrollment and physical device management kind of thing and mobile no that is not the plan you won't see an android option or a yeah, no, ios awesome. option uh in hdx it will be more focused on the user and how they experience the apps than the actual physical device management itself yeah i think it's a, both great answers and i think that that really makes a ton of sense because sometimes you see companies kind of go down and try to do you know the do something for everybody, right? And, yeah. and that's where you start losing that focus and you guys being focused on the core kind of digital experience, the end user experience is, is awesome. So it's good to hear that. So I'm, uh, I'm also looking at the clock and I think we're about eight minutes uh, out from uh, the formal end of, uh, of, of this coffee break. It's, it's a very long coffee break, by the way. 
Um, so I, I also want to make sure that we keep enough time here for any other questions that you've seen come in and that weren't answered yet, uh, Shane. Yeah, no, great point. Yeah, there, so there was uh, there are two questions here. So one was around, um, you know, what about wireless environments where users are on the move and switching access points, kind of warehouse environments, that sort of thing. I think the context around that is, you know, will you see that update here in the console uh, as those at the as that device roams across those different access points? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, yes. We are our real time product can do that. And actually, let me try to uh, demonstrate that here. Try, obviously, we do live demos, so it's always really, really interesting and fun. But yeah, exactly. Um, a scenario I have that I, I found really important why we do the BSSID and stuff is uh, when I was working in healthcare, we had workstation on wheels or computer on wheels, which these are devices that move around the hospital. And we had one access point where every time that workstation on wheels would connect to it, uh, it would drop. So which session am I on here? Um, and... The network team kept saying, nope, it's not the network, it's not the network. We have other devices connected to it. It's totally fine. It's Citrix. And of course, we're like, it's not Citrix because um, uh, because everyone else is connected to it. It's only happening at this one location and only on the workstation wheels when they move from one location to another. That was not sufficient for them to actually solve the problem. What, what they had to do is uh, uh, the whole access point eventually died and then they replaced it and that that this session disconnect dropped but if this information was available back then i would have been able to see okay we're getting a lot of disconnects when this wi-fi access point is getting connected to um so here i am i'm on this particular user he's on my t home 2 network i'm going to try switching to my t home b network and we'll see if my session maintains uh control or citrix session uh, oh, no, well, let me connect to that network. Let me try a different one. Yeah, while you're, yes, while you're this oh, will update. Ahead, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah go, uh, ahead, go ahead. No, was, that's awesome. And I was just saying another question came in just kind of around uh, Edge DX and, uh, sorry, the, around the Remote DX specifically in Edge DX. So I think uh, Joel Boom. answered that. And Remote DX is, you know, virtual channel extension. Remote DX, uh, Edge DX is a full agent just kind of for those folks out there. And then I put a note that the latest current release from Citrix 2109, by default, they're kind of blacklisting all virtual channels. So basically, right. uh, yeah, if it's custom, so in this case, remote DX, probably wanna kind of, I just made a note there, we'd wanna whitelist that, um, you know, if anyone's kind of testing this now and went to the current release, so. Yeah, and about uh, the yeah. Chromebooks question, uh, we currently do not have a Chromebooks extension. Uh, I know that there has been some work done on Good our question, side. Yeah. Uh, it's just that, we haven't had any customers yet that say we need this, right? And as you probably know from other vendors, you know, kind of like priorities are being determined on who needs it. Need uh, but, you know, if this is something, bring it up with uh, with choice or bring it up with the, uh, the the control of account team and we can definitely see what we can do there. And I think a good question to bring up, no one asked, but uh, I think just... Um... Uh, you know, I think it's a good question, right? Because in the question being, you know, it, this is great. We're seeing all this great technology, you know, real time aspect, you know, scripted actions, all these great things. Like how easy is it to get up and going, right? You know, how, how quick can we get up and going? You know, for, from my perspective, you know, being a, you know, being a partner, we get to use a consultant license, which is great. So we typically use this in all of our customer engagements to start out and kind of gather that data real time during health checks and troubleshooting and things like that. But if a customer wanted to say, hey, you know, I want to do this for a proof of concept, I mean, we typically get that up within, you know, within like two hours and then two hours being it's more educational, right? It's, it's a time if you're like, we just recently worked with a bank where they had a really lockdown environment. So we had to open up the firewall ports for outbound and stuff like that. But from an architectural perspective, you know, the console runs in, in memory, it's real time. It just basically installs. There's no, um, you know, there's no backend databases or IS tiers or anything like that. So kind of a SaaS control plane and, and trend. You can cover more on that if, if you want, but uh, it, point being is it's quick to get up and going. So. Uh, absolutely, Shane. And I think uh, I, want, I want to make a comment about HDX, which uh, trend that just showed that is fully born and running in the cloud. Uh, so that was, uh, there's no, except for the agent, of course, there's no on-prem components. Um, Scout bees, we didn't talk about that today, but our synthetic transaction monitoring, again, fully cloud born and cloud living. Uh, there are, there's an option to run these synthetic tests kind of within the confines of your own network, but to get up and running, it's like a click on a button and you're, you're, you know, you're good to go. And we offer you know, free trials. 
you don't even have to put in an email address, you know, like for all our technologies. So, uh, uh, well, except for the SaaS solutions, because we need to send, yeah. You, you need yeah. to log in, but um, uh, there's no calls from salespeople or whatever if you want to get started. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I personally really enjoy about Control Up, honestly, is the low pressure of you guys from a sales organization, I think is really awesome. And we're actually, it blends well with our culture. We're the same way. We're not going to call you 50 times to try to go and take a trial. We're, we're about kind of long-term relationships and, and it kind of blends well with, with our culture. So we were really excited about that. And, and I just put a, a comment in the chat. If you're interested in kind of a, a, a POC, uh, just give us your, your home address, you know, DNA, that sort of thing. And we'll come, no, I'm just, <laughs> just, uh, just press one and, and, uh, and Ellie can, can follow up with you if you, if you guys are interested um, or you could always, you know, reach out through the normal channels uh, obviously as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think we're, we're out of time here. I tried to yep. go on. Yeah, I just wanted to just to, to finalize that question. I want to make sure everyone saw I was changing the Wi Fi network, it was updating the stats in real time as that change was occurring. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. And what I love too about this here is you can export all this data, just, you know, just click export and all the columns get exported for, for sorting in Excel and stuff like that it really makes it just an awesome tool for, for troubleshooting. So but uh, yeah, yeah so I, I, okay. I guess I wanted to thank uh, you yeah. guys, uh, Shane yeah. and Brian, and I think Ali is still somewhere on uh, for, for having us today, because I think these events are great where we get to talk directly with, with your customers and give them an update. So thank you for, uh, for having me and Trenton uh, and uh, deliver, deliver some news about controller. No, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Joel, Shane, Trenton, thank you guys so much for the time and also too for the customers. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we do value your time. Um, De Ellie did put a digital survey in the marketing piece. Uh, please do us a favor, meaning uh, Control Up was extremely generous in supporting this event and the, the wicked cool temperature controlled. The only thing they ask for is just some feedback. So if you wouldn't mind doing us a favor and film that out and we would welcome the chance to, like I said, talk about what you're currently doing with the product and some other th considerations. And if you're not utilizing technology at all, welcome that. Because like I said, when we engage a project, it's not a matter of if we're going to use the tool, it's more of how we're going to use the tool and how we're going to be of support. So we appreciate your time. We value your partnership. We look forward to the discussions. And thank you for joining us today and have an awesome day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks.